Hey everyone and welcome back to Hayes Kitchen. Slight twist this week. We did a coffee series about a year ago now. Um, and I've recently given up coffee for New Year. Um, reason being, not because I don't love coffee, I do absolutely love it, but it makes me quite jittery. Okay. So, the reason I've given it up is when I've done a few little film shoots and things, I started getting jittery hands. I couldn't work out what it was. It was just the caffeine in my three strong espressos a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got Don here from May Tea, um, who is literally an expert in every single bit of knowledge you need about tea. So that's why I brought him along today and he's gonna teach me everything we need to know about the basis of from growing through to serving. So you, this, is, this is gonna be your big crash course in tea, right? Yeah, but we're gonna try and get this done in about a four to five minute video. Yeah, no, no challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Ian. So over to you, I want you to take control of this because I wanna learn as much as you guys probably do as well. Okay, well, so the first thing to really point out is that there's a big difference between what we're talking about today and your kind of commodity tea. Of course, it's from the same plant, but it's processed and, and, and grown in a completely kind of different way. There's machine picked and machine grown, and then there's the top drawer, really top shelf stuff, right? right okay. Which is what we're dealing with here. So this is true tea. This is single estate, true tea, all loose leaf. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's like, the way that I'd like you to think about it is just push the reset button, because the thing about tea is it's the most consumed drink in the world right. after water, yep. yet 99% of people in the West yep. know nothing about it. Yeah, I'm, right? a, so, I'm that person. So it's better to just start from square one. Yeah. There is a plant called Camellia sinensis. All tea comes from Camellia sinensis, yep. right? But just like the wine plant, right, which all wine comes from the grape, yep. there are many different varieties. Right, right, okay. Thousands of different varieties. I'm with you. I'm with okay. you on this bit. We're, so far, we're good. Yes, <laughs> I mentioned wine, we're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, thousands of different varieties. Um, and then, obviously, the same things that affect wine affect tea. So, the terroir, the whole kind of uh, microclimate, where it was grown, which side of the, the mountain it was, it was grown on, the soil, the surrounding nature, the season that it was picked, one of the big difference, differences between wine and tea is that wine is picked once a year, right, okay. right? Tea is picked multiple times in the year, so you get different grades throughout the yep. year, and you get high grades and low grades. Mm -hmm. So there's so much complexity in tea, there's so much to understand and to delve into. So this is gonna be your crash course into it. I'm up right? for this. Right, there are six types, main types of tea, and the type of tea is defined by the processing. Okay, right. it's not defined by the plant, mm -hmm. right? So there are varieties which are better suited to white tea and green tea, yep. but theoretically, you could make any tea type out of any tea plant, right? Okay. It's the processing that makes the, the difference, difference, right? So we're gonna go through these. So the main difference in the types of tea is the oxidation level, white tea. So what you want to find in white tea is um, young picked, it doesn't have to be just buds, sometimes it's buds and leaves, yeah. but the processing of it is very, very simple. What they have to do is pick the leaf and they wither it and dry it under the sun. And that means because it takes a few hours for that to happen, mm -hmm. it will oxidize slightly. So that's about 10% oxidized, something okay. like that, right? Yeah. Then you've got green tea. And the idea of green tea is to fix the leaf, to try and keep it as fresh and vibrant as possible, yeah. right? So what they do is immediately after picking, they will heat the leaf up, just like the spinach leaf, yeah? Yep. So they'll heat the leaf up, usually um, in pans, if they're doing it in China, mm -hmm. and in Japan they steam it, which is why Japanese tea tastes different to Chinese ah. tea, because you get more of the nuttiness and more of the warmth yeah, yeah, of with the pan baked yep. versus the very fresh, vibrant steaming. Of, so, you know, there's, okay. the process makes a difference. So green tea is being heated up, yep. and that stops the oxidation process. Yep. It's called the stay green process for yep. obvious reasons or the fixing process. And that means that they can then manipulate it. You can see that this one here has been uh, rolled up and it's very, very, very fine. You can see it's beautiful, really, isn't it? really, really fine. It almost looks like it's, it's powder, but when you actually zoom in on it, you can see it is really fine individual leaves. Right, next up is yellow tea. The most rare tea in terms of production uh, levels. Hardly any yellow tea is produced. It's got a grassy smell yeah, to it. Yeah, right. Really, really interesting, um, kind of um, fresh cut grass. Fresh cut, sun, a little bit of summer lawn. Yeah, it's also got some a little bit of, of, of raw nuts. It's also got a little bit of kind of pears and apples, but very, very light. So in order to make yellow tea, 
Um, they will produce it in a similar way to green tea, but then after they've heated it up, they'll put it in like a, a humid environment for about two days. Okay. And what that does is it's, it's like saying to the leaf, all right, we've, we've stopped the enzyme oxidation, we've killed that off, yeah. but now we're gonna put you in a, in a humid environment so you can change Take a bit more, you can change yeah. a bit. So it kind of takes away some of the green stringency and becomes smoother, becomes right. rounder. Next up is oolong tea, the biggest variety of them all. In essence, the big thing with oolong tea is that it's semi-oxidized. So that means that you've got your greens, which are kind of zero to 5% oxidation. Yeah. You've got your whites, which is about 10% oxidation, something like that. You've got your blacks, which is kind of like anything above 85%. And yeah. then you've got this massive window between 10% and 85%, gotcha. and that's oolong tea. So right. what they do to make this tea is they'll pick the leaf. Usually it's, it's, they use slightly larger leaves, if you, as you've seen yeah, yeah. With, the, with the recipe you did before, slightly mm -hmm. larger leaves. Um, and they will intentionally oxidize it. And the way that they do that is by shaking the leaf. They'll either do that on a bamboo mat, so they'll hand shake it, yeah. or they'll put them in rollers, and they kind of shake it, and that oh, just wow. bruises the leaf. It, it, it starts to, to, to cause a little bit of damage to the leaf, and that releases the uh, essential oils and the plant sap, and that reacts with the oxygen and oxidizes. So they're stimulating the oxidation process, which is why you can see it's quite a lot darker. So it, I don't know if this is just my nose, but I don't think that smells of hardly anywhere near as strong as the yellow tea but once you put water on there, I find that a lot stronger than the rest. Yeah. See, the key thing with judging quality of tea, unfortunately, yeah. is that the dry leaf very, gives you, apart from the visuals, mm -hmm. the smell of the dry leaf gives you very little indication of the quality. Right. You have to, it has to be hit with hot water. And when, once it's hit with hot water, then you can judge it. And right. this is a big problem for tea sellers, right? Because you mm -hmm. go into a tea shop and you're like, you, everyone wants to smell yeah, the tea. Yeah, and that's why scented teas and artificially scented teas have dominated the market, right? Because yeah. everyone's going into these tea shops going, well, I can't smell anything here. I'll buy that one, which is but a bad, pina colada. Water, yeah, like, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay, I get it. So when you hit it with hot water, all the artificial fragrance goes and you're left with usually meh. Meh, yeah. almost meh, the tea. Yeah. The, 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 the very technical term for bad tea, meh. So uh, which one's the Yorkshire tea? Um, so, <laughs> so technically Yorkshire tea is a black tea, which leads me on to this one here. So a black tea is uh, fully oxidized. So they take the leaf and they roll it fully. So now sometimes the most expensive stuff is actually hand rolled. So they'll actually take leaf by leaf and they'll roll. But most of the time it's done in small batches in kind of manual machines. It, they just twist it up. And what you don't want to do is break the leaf. So you, again, you can see it's whole leaf. No, I mean in the production process. See, that's got chocolatey tones to it. Yeah? Like you a cocoa sort of Absolutely. Dark chocolate notes on that Been one. doing a little research. So that's the big difference between these five, right? Yeah. Um, and I should say there's lots more, right? There's roasting. There's like, A lot of people don't realize that after a tea is made, it's usually sent to roasters, just like coffee. Yeah. And they have their own parameters. You get light roasted, dark roasted. So there's lots and lots to, to, to keep diving into. But that's the basics on those teas. The sixth type of tea is like a world unto itself. Okay. Right? What's the sixth type of tea? It's post-fermented tea. Okay, so what oh, they yeah. do is they pick the leaf and they usually pick it from very specific plants that, that grow in relatively wild environments. Yeah. You need that kind of uh, varied ecosystem mm -hmm. because what you're looking for is microorganisms that live on the leaf. Right, okay. You want bacteria, you want good fungi, you want like, you know, really kind of interesting um, uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then they'll heat the leaf up, but not too hot because they don't want to kill it off. Yeah. And then they'll usually compress it into these cakes. And then what happens is because this tea is technically still alive, feel free to open it. Am I, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, sure. I know these are not the... No, yes. Oh, wow. So the, this tea is technically kind of still changing and it's reacting to the environment. So the place that you store it is really, really important. So this is a 2016. This is nearly two years old. So this is fermenting now then? Yeah. Okay, because it's got a tobacco smell. Right, exactly. Fresh rolled tobacco. Yeah. You get those kind of more plummy dried fruit notes 
to the tea. That is a thing this of is beauty. this is the this is the so you have tea lovers and you have post fermented addicts, right? Okay. There are people that will only search for this kind of tea, right? Because yeah. it is, and it, it all depends on the age of the tea tree. So this is five hundred year old gushu. When you have older tea trees, what that means is you've got longer, deeper roots, right? It's not competing for the same soil. Gushu. Gushu means ancient tea tree. Usually anything over about 150, 200 years old can be considered gushu. Yeah. And because it's got longer, deeper roots, yeah. it, it, it's able to draw from soil that the other plants can't reach. Right. So it's it much, it more, different flavor. much more mineral rich, okay. really, really mineral rich. Are we trying that one today? We can try whatever you would like. Really? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Just the, the final, the final uh, thing is, if um, you want, right? So producers. So this is this is what we call raw yeah. post fermented tea. Yeah. So that's changing over time, slowly over years, and it will take about twenty years for it to get to this color. Right. right? Okay. This is what they do is they they speed up that process. So what they'll do is they'll take the leaf and they'll put it in a hot, humid environment. It's fermenting super fast. It's like wow. your kombuchas or your one? kefirs. Yeah, yeah. So that's gonna smell a lot more earthy, a lot richer oh, and a God. lot darker. Yeah, that is a, you can almost smell the soil. Yeah. That's bonkers. So you're smelling the terroir, you're smelling those wild forests, right? So that's it. So you've got your, your white, your green, your yellow, your oolong, black, and your post-fermented tea. That's your crash course. Did you get all that? <laughs> Because I think that was a brilliant way of explaining it, so especially to me. I'm fascinated by this. So there's so many important things about tea. Obviously, you've got the flavours in there. You've got the, the, the brewing time. You've got the, the way it's broken down. Um, one of the essential things is, as you, a lot of you know, I use this Zip Tap. Um, I'm part, part of their brand ambassador for the company, if you like. One of the things it does is it controls temperature, which with tea is one of the most important things. Is that right? Absolutely. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they use boiling hot water on delicate teas. And it's not about scalding the tea or scorching the tea or burning the tea. A lot of people talk about that. It's all about extraction. When you have really hot water, it extracts very quickly. But the problem is then you've got less control. Gotcha. Because there are some notes in the leaf that you want a little bit, but you don't mm. want too much, just like cooking, right? Yeah. You don't want to over flood it with salt, right? Yeah. So. For example, green tea has very high catechins. We've talked about that. And those are really good for, you, for, you, for your health, etc. But yeah. they can have a bitter astringent. No, and, sometime, and some astringency and bitterness is a good thing. You want that. You don't want yeah. it to be totally flat, right? Mm -hmm. But if you use boiling hot water, it's all going to come out in one go. So you have yeah. no control, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you use 80 degree water, or yeah. even you can then control it. You can brew it the right kind of length of time pour it and you will not get so much of the catechins. So the way that I look at it, the analogy that I like to make is the temperature is like EQ on a sound system, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's your way of balancing, it's balancing, it's it. balancing it. And that's why the brewing process is so fundamental. You getting into the brewing process is so fundamental to enjoying tea. Do you want to go for something light or do you want to try going for something a little bit, a bit darker, a little yeah, bit darker? Let's go for a little bit of a punch. Yeah? yeah? I think you should try the oolong because a lot of people, when they, want, when they kind of first get into tea, they're, they're trying the greens, but they mm. haven't had really experience with oolongs. Oolong, I love. I've had it just with food. So it's okay. only with the cooking process right. I've used it with. So yeah, I'd like to try that. Let's try this. So this is a medium uh, roasted oolong, which means that, you know, it's been roasted. Um, and we're going to do it in a guy one here. So that's, that's a guy one, right? Yep. Which is the, the very basic, but I love the primitive nature of just a bowl with a lid. Totally. We're going to put some oolong in here. I'm just going to eyeball it, but that's probably about five or six grams. No one knows measurements on my channel. Yeah. Because <laughs> I always just say a handful or a glove. You're gonna see how much this expands though. It's really, really interesting. So some hot water. So it's important, as I said, to make sure that you have the right temperature. With oolong tea, you want about 95 degree water. Okay, so it's a lot hotter. So it's a lot hotter than your green teas. As I said, it's larger leaves, right? And so they have um, less catechin, so you don't have to worry so much about the bitterness. You want to extract a nice, strong flavor. What you like to, what we like to do, is rinse the tea. Yep. You can pour it on your tea pet if you've got one of those. What does that do? Uh, it's just for fun, and it changes color. But it's, it's, it, they use it for kind of offerings. Sometimes you have kind of religious. Um, the uh, ceremony. Yeah, sort it's, of that's style. the ceremony part. Of it. It's a company, um, mm -hmm. and then have a smell, so you can smell. Wow, the strength. 
So very different, right? You said that the dry tea didn't smell of too much. Now you can really smell it. What am I getting on there, Ascent? <laughs> the difficulty. This is what we always have to try and come up with. What is the smell? There's a real sweetness in there. Mm. It's almost, this is going to sound really crazy. You know the pantry smell you get mm. when you have a pantry with all your herbs and spices and flowers and mixtures. It's almost that mm. sort of smell. So it's, it's not really one thing. Yeah, it's complex, isn't it? So this is a Taiwanese oolong. Right. It's called Amber Gabba. I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why it's called Amber Gabba is because this has actually been put into a nitrogen chamber. Right. right, okay, that's the next level. So that's the next level, exactly. Right. And a nitrogen chamber point is that the leaf then freaks out a little bit and it naturally produces GABA. Right. GABA is a neurotransmitter that yeah. already exists in your body mm -hmm. and it's like a break on your uh, nervous system. So it's kind of calming, relaxing. It's got a chilled out kind of feel to it, this tea. Um, remember, a lot of people drink tea, not just for the flavor, but for those psychoactive effects. So you yeah. can get lots of different effects. Like you gotta be careful with that one. What psychedelic effects? You can get very tea drunk, yeah. yeah. If, especially with the old, with the older tea tree stuff like that. The yeah, especially stuff. when it's fermenting away. Exactly. So, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. That's nice. Oh, it's a nice cuppa. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it's got that. It's got a little bit of that. Um, uh, astringent, drying, it's got a little bit of sourness, but it's also got sweetness, it's also got some caramel. Caramel in there, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, especially at the end, after you swallow. If you breathe out through your nose afterwards, you get that nice, slightly burnt caramel kind of note to it. It's toffee. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's lovely. And you can see that this has literally just started, right? This yeah. is not even close to... So 10 to 15, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 10, so it's 10 good money ones. money weight then, isn't it, surely? Look, tea for what you're getting for a hand-produced um, product like this with mm -hmm. the, the level of artisanship, yep. it's incredibly affordable. Look, this has been fascinating for me. Hopefully you guys at home enjoyed this one as well. And let me know if you want to see more of this style of video. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. Absolute pleasure. Check out Don's website and check out his YouTube channel. He's got some fascinating videos that really go in a lot more depth than this. We're talking proper... 30 yeah. minute long Proper videos. geek. Proper but they're geek. so interesting. It's called May Tea. Go and check it out. There's a link in the description box down below which takes you straight through to his website. Go and click subscribe. Give him some love as well. Now following on from this, we couldn't have all this tea without making a really interesting recipe. So following on, we're going to do a braised belly of pork, Chinese style with some bok choy and rice. So watch out for that. And then we have got uh, your cocktail, which is a... A ruby storm. A riff on the dark and stormy, but with tea. And that's going to be on Don's uh, next week. Okay, so next Saturday, check out. I'll be posting Instagram for that as well. And then finally, I couldn't do a big bulky main with not doing a dessert. So I've come Absolutely. up with a matcha tea coconut sorbet, I suppose, yes. with um, a chocolate crumb and a beautiful black forest glaze. Um, go check them out in a week's time. Thanks so much for watching. Comment down below if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like this. I'll see you next week. Cheers then. Bye-bye. See ya.